So let's take a second to remember where we are with HVAC fundamentals. So we started off by introducing this concept of sensible and latent loads. We plotted those air properties and the HVAC processes to address those loads on the psych chart. We took a look at the HVAC equipment that helps address those loads, the pumping systems that move those loads between the plant and the zone. Now we're going to take a look at the airside systems in our buildings. Let's take a second to consider what we mean when we say airside buildings. So we could be talking about systems like these. So you may have vacuum systems in medical applications or in industry manufacturing settings. You may also have compressed air that is used to run cleaning nozzles that may be in a lab environment or part of your control air system in older buildings. But for our purposes, these aren't the systems that we're going to be discussing. When we say airside systems, we're talking more about these pieces of equipment. So the air handling units that move air for really two reasons. There's two main functions that we can talk about with airside systems. The first is to condition air, so either to heat, cool, or dehumidify the air before it gets to a zone. And we talked about in the HVAC loads and processes, the psychrometrics involved in those processes. And then ventilation is really that second role that we haven't discussed yet. So ventilation can really be isolated from load management. There's a slight caveat there that we'll say any introduction of outside air, that air may need to be tempered or now represents a new HVAC load outside of what you may be trying to address in the zone. But really the goal is to provide fresh outdoor air to occupants in our spaces and address any toxins that may be building up. So ASHRAE 62.1 is the standard that predominantly is going to help us determine how much of that outside air ventilation needs to be brought in. And they offer a couple different ways to calculate that. So the first procedure that's covered in this standard is natural ventilation. So this is something that may be rarely used because a lot needs to be known about the wind dynamics of your site and you have to very carefully design not just your HVAC but your entire envelope and architecture to support the types of thermal buoyancy by creating heat stacks and by understanding how the air is going to move from the outside of your space through penetrations and then is going to naturally take that hot air and move it out of the building. There's also a way to calculate the toxin levels directly and then determine how much fresh air needs to be introduced to address those toxins and that's the indoor air quality procedure. So I would say this is also rarely used and this is maybe more of a specific lab or manufacturing environment where you have a good understanding about what those toxin levels will be so that you can calculate the airflow to address them. Really what's going to drive most of the ventilation design in our buildings is going to be the third procedure which is the ventilation rate procedure or VRP. So this is a more basic way of trying to understand based on space type and how large those spaces are and how many people occupy them, how much ventilation should be provided. So that's really the powerhouse here that we'll talk about and might be a way to do some quick checks to understand if your zone is being underventilated or overventilated. So here's an excerpt from ASHRAE standard 62.1, there is a number of space types or applications. And what you do is you read these CFM per person, the CFM per square foot, and those are factors that you apply to the number of people and the square foot in your space, and that will give you your zone outdoor airflow. There's a little bit of backing into different numbers when you try to understand how much outdoor air should be brought in at your economizer, and then what the percent of that outdoor versus recirculated air would be that needs to be provided by your supplier system. But just to understand the requirements of our zones using this standard, this is the approach we would take. So that's the role of air in our buildings. Let's take a minute now and actually look at what some of the key components are in those systems. So this is the black box air handling unit that you can't see into when you walk into your mechanical room, but you can understand that there's an inlet or suction side and a discharge or outlet side and how air comes in as outside air, return or recirculated air or some mixed combination of the two and then leaves the air handling unit as conditioned supply air 
to be brought to the vo zone for ventilation and or load management purposes. So this is what it might look like on the inside. Some pretty standard components. There's going to be many variations of this as we'll get into different ways to classify. But a lot of times what you see is this at first, starting with the inlet side, is this chamber or plenum for outside air to come into and possibly mix with that recirculated or return air. Filters designed to protect equipment such as coils and fans, as well as provide some air filtration for indoor environmental quality purposes. A single or combination of coils designed to do the load management with that mixed air. A supply fan, which in this case is a belt driven squirrel cage or centrifugal fan. And then we'll have some plenum or some combination of fittings to help get to the main supply duct and get that conditioned filtered air to the zones. So the two key components that we want to pause on here are the coils and the fans, because these are the two that are really doing the work and the heat transfer in this device. So we talked a little bit about the equations that govern performances for coils. So as a recap, for sensible heating, on the air side, what you'll see in the way that we can quantify how much HVAC load can be addressed by this coil is a product of 1.08 times the CFM or airflow going across the coil and the temperature change in degrees Fahrenheit that you see across the coil. If you're doing any type of cooling, so if you're actually dehumidifying any moisture out of the air, we can't use the above equation, we have to use the total enthalpy equation, which is this 4.5 times CFM times delta H, or the change in enthalpy across the coil. Regardless of the application, we can also use for hydronic coils this water side equation of 500 times GPM or gallons per minute times the delta T of the water. So the water on the inlet of the coil and the change to the water of the outlet of the coil. And we also talked about the electrical energy that it takes to get the water through the coil or the pumping load associated with that water. Well, it's a similar story on the air side with the fan. There's a certain amount of electrical load that because of the device similarity will take on a lot of likeness with the pump equation. And that's what we're going to talk about in our next video. But just to pause on the differences between these systems, there may be a lot of similarities, but we can point out a few things that are going to distinguish themselves. So water on the pumping side system is incompressible to where the air being a vapor will be compressible. And that changes a little bit of the dynamics about how we pump versus how we have air move through a fan system. With pumping systems, we essentially have a closed loop in most cases. So there's no direct interaction with the atmosphere. Well, with fan systems, they're inherently open. So as with a piping system, you have that piping infrastructure as the discrete boundary. With the envelope, as tight as it may be, it's, there's always going to be a certain amount of leakage and a certain amount of exfiltration or infiltration. So we really need to consider that building envelope as part of our air system. With pumps, we may send treated water through the system to keep the equipment protected. With fans, we may have things like air filters that have a purpose of protecting equipment as well. However, we also have indoor environmental air quality to contend with. With pumping systems, there's only a few configurations that we may see in the field. We talked about how primary, secondary, variable volume systems may be common. However, with airside systems, we're going to see there's a number of different classifications of how the distribution is set up, how the plant air handling unit is set up and where it's located, about different approaches and methodologies it can take. So we'll get into how you can classify your airside systems so that you can really make sense of what you're looking at in the field. But before we do, we're going to delve into the fan equation to understand the components contained in that formula to be able to quantify the fan energy used in our airside systems.